This is a mechanism of disease map for intracerebral hemorrhage. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of intracerebral hemorrhage. And as in all of these flowcharts, each of these boxes is color coded according to these core concepts listed at the top right of the slide. I'll be clearing all of these bubbles and talking through each of them one by one. So let's get started. First, let's define the intracerebral hemorrhage. It's defined as a brain bleed specifically into the brain parenchyma. Now, an intracerebral hemorrhage is a type of stroke that's categorized under hemorrhagic strokes, and it differs from the subarachnoid hemorrhage, another type of hemorrhagic stroke, in that you have bleeding into the brain parenchyma, the brain tissue itself, as opposed to into the subarachnoid space. Both intracerebral hemorrhages and subarachnoid hemorrhages differ from ischemic strokes in which you have the opposite problem, the brain not getting enough blood. But in this case, you have too much blood, you're bleeding into the brain parenchyma. The etiologies of intracerebral hemorrhage can be categorized as traumatic and non-traumatic. The traumatic one is very easy to understand. It sounds exactly like what it is. You have blunt or penetrating injury that causes damage to blood vessels, which then triggers this bleed into the brain parenchyma. The non-traumatic causes are much more varied, and we'll go through each of them one by one. The most prominent non-traumatic cause of intracerebral hemorrhage is chronic arterial hypertension. This is the same type of hypertension that you get from eating too much salt and living a sedentary lifestyle and too many cigarettes and alcohol. Um, it's just your run-of-the-mill um, risk factor for many diseases, chronic hypertension. In this case, the hypertension forms these Charcot-Bouchard microaneurysms, and over an extended period of time, these microaneurysms can rupture, and that triggers the bleed into the brain. The most common place for bleeding is the putamen, followed by the thalamus, followed by other parts of the brain like the pons and the cerebellum. So that's the most common cause of non-traumatic intracerebral hemorrhage. The most common cause of non-traumatic intracerebral hemorrhage in patients that are over 60 years old is cerebral amyloid angiopathy. The pathophysiology here is similar to Alzheimer's disease. You have deposition of this errant protein in a place that it shouldn't be. In this case, you have deposition of beta amyloid peptides in the vessel walls. That causes focal damage with formation of microaneurysms, which can then rupture and cause this bleed into the brain parenchyma. Next, structural abnormalities can form in the brain. These include vascular malformations. When you have vascular malformations in a network that receives a heavy, uh, high-pressure amount of blood, some of those malformations will receive excessive strain, and that can cause them to rupture. So vascular malformations like AVMs and um, microaneurysms, those can rupture and be a cause of intracerebral hemorrhage. Next, there are a few coagulopathies that can cause impaired hemostasis and can lead to intracerebral hemorrhages. One example is the hemophilias. These are genetic or hereditary disorders. Patients can also be on anticoagulants that prevent them from doing normal hemostasis. When you have impaired hemostasis, you're going to accumulate microtrauma in the vasculature, and that can lead to bleeding um, into the brain parenchyma once you've like broken through your vasculature. So it, the microtraumas kind of accumulate, and if you're not able to clot them, if you're not able to do normal hemostasis, that can lead to a brain bleed. There are a few predisposing etiologies that involve inflammation or an inflammatory process. And inflammatory tissue necrosis can, of course, damage vessels and cause this bleed. First, neoplasms and cancers, such as meningioma. This um, is an inflammatory state. Cancer is a highly inflammatory process. And in fact, cancer can also be an anticoagulant process. It can be procoagulant, it can be anticoagulant. Um, it can mess up your blood hemostasis and cause intracerebral hemorrhage in multiple ways. So cancer can cause inflammation as well as um, hemostatic disturbances. Ischemia can also lead to inflammation. What typically happens is a patient has an ischemic stroke, and then when they finally get reperfusion, it can cause reperfusion injury if the reperfusion happens too quickly. Um, that, of course, can also happen. Uh, that, that can also cause inflammation and tissue necrosis. Infections can also be very inflammatory. The most common example here is HSV encephalitis, which can damage the vessels and cause bleeding. 
Lastly, there are some uh, primary immunology disorders, primary inflammatory disorders. This includes the vasculitides, such as giant cell arteritis, which can cause tissue necrosis and damage vessels, causing a hemorrhage. Next, there's acute arterial hypertension. This is in contrast to the chronic arterial hypertension that we saw up here. Some things that acutely raise your blood pressure include stimulants. This includes drugs that are generally thought of as uppers, like cocaine and methamphetamines, as well as venous outflow obstruction. Both of these can acutely increase your blood pressure and lead to a bleed. Lastly, we have one more infectious cause. Infective endocarditis can throw off some septic emboli, which can be thrown up into the vessels going up to your brain and cause a bleed into the brain parenchyma. So those are the etiologies. Many of them are non-traumatic, and of course there's also traumatic injuries that can cause bleeding into the brain. Next, let's talk about the manifestations. The symptoms tend to progress gradually over a time period of minutes to hours. The most common or the most uh, famous symptom is headache, and there are a few things that cause headaches in intracerebral hemorrhage. These are listed here. First, the blood itself that's bleeding into the brain tissue can irritate the meninges that surround the brain tissue. That contributes to headache. Secondly, you can have meningeal traction when you're kind of pulling on the meninges because you have this new volume, this new fluid that's taking up room in the brain tissue can also predispose you to headache. Third, you're increasing your intracranial pressure, which also predisposes you to headache. The intracranial pressure can also cause many other symptoms that are associated with intracerebral hemorrhage. These include nausea, vomiting, confusion, fixed pupils, bradycardia, widened pulse pressure, irregular breathing, and loss of consciousness. And you might recall that these three symptoms, bradycardia, widened pulse pressure, and irregular breathing, make up Cushing's triad, which are symptoms that you get when you have increased intracranial pressure. In very severe cases, the high intracranial pressure can also cause brain herniation, which of course would exacerbate many of these symptoms as well. Uh, most prominently, loss of consciousness is a big concern when a certain part of the brain herniates through one of the skull's openings. It's very dangerous. Next, let's kind of differentiate some other manifestations based on where you have the bleed itself. The most common places to bleed in intracerebral hemorrhage are the putamen. This makes up about 56% of intracerebral hemorrhages. Next most common is the thalamus, which makes up about 31% of intracerebral hemorrhages. The symptoms for both of these, uh, they have some overlap, but there are some distinguishing features, and we'll talk about those. Both of them cause contralateral hemiparesis and, hemipar and hemiplegia. So you're not able to move the opposite side of your body. If you have a bleed into the left thalamus or the left putamen, you won't be able to move the right side of the body. In addition, you'll also have contralateral hemisensory loss. So you'll uh, kind of lose sensation on that opposite side as well. So if they both cause both of these symptoms, how might you differentiate the bleeds into the thalamus from the bleeds into the putamen? The putamen has an eye deviation toward the side of the hematoma. So you're going to use the eyes to differentiate which side of the brain you're bleeding into, or which part of the brain you're bleeding into. So the putamen has eyes that deviate toward the, hemato uh, the hematoma. So the, the putamen looks at the side of the of the of the bleed, whereas the thalamus has what we call wrong way eyes, where your eyes look away from the side of the hematoma. In addition, bleeds into the thalamus can also uh, kind of contribute to that loss of consciousness that you have. So these are the main ways to differentiate between these bleeds. It's uh, where your eyes deviate. If your eyes go toward the side of the hematoma, it's uh, more likely to be a putamen bleed. If they go away from the side of the hematoma, it's more likely to be a thalamus bleed. Lastly, the hemorrhage can extend into the ventricles of the brain, and when that happens, it's called hydrocephalus, where you have a high volume in those ventricles, and that can also kind of exacerbate some of these problems, um, the other manifestations of intracerebral hemorrhage. This has been a short mechanism of disease map. I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.